Thank you, Paul, and uh, welcome everybody. It's great to have a, have a good, uh, healthy crowd here uh, to talk about what is really a national asset, the Great Smoky, Smoky Mountains National Park, uh, that uh, that we think of as a regional thing, but but uh, we're about to celebrate the centennial of it, and I, the centennial actually begins here uh, in in Knoxville because what the, the the people getting together to found the national park was a Knoxville story to begin with. And uh, that's what we're, that's the story we're going to be telling about the first uh, eight or 10 years or so of the, of the, uh, of the process, the extremely complicated process of, of creating a national park. Um, but uh, we, uh, we're grateful for you to, to join us. Uh, and, uh, and I think we'll be hearing a lot about the centennial of the national park for the next, uh, oh, uh, what, uh, 17 years or so, because there's a lot of different steps involved with founding the National Park, uh, and I think uh, culminating with the uh, dedication when Franklin Roosevelt came here in 1940. Uh, some, of, some of us may or may not live to, to see that centennial, but uh, we're, uh, we're, we're celebrating the very beginning of it now, and uh, we expect you'll hear much more, but today it's a, mostly a Knoxville story, and uh, uh, we're glad to bring that to you. And I'll, I'll yield uh, to uh, to Paul James, who's done a great deal of, uh, of research into the Smoky Mountains and the people involved in its founding uh, on it, on his own. And uh, so he's kind of our our authority on the subject uh, in the office here. But uh, we we all have something to share about this. So but I'll let uh, let Paul take it from here. OK, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, one of the things that we would like to kick off is, is kind of talking about um, some of the early explorers of, of the late 1800s. Um, it's long been suggested that, you know, before this movement to create a national park started in Knoxville in 1923, that really the, the main prior uh, movement was in Asheville in 1899, but um, at least was a little one before that. But before I get into that, um, there's a wonderful book actually called Terra Incognita that was part of our UT Press two, three years ago, Ken Wise and Ann Bridges and, and another fellow whose name I can't quite recall. Um, and it features um, you know, extracts and, and uh, examples of some of the early writers. Um, obviously, people who were writing about the Smokies needed to be there, just like today. Uh, and of course, very few people were going to the Smokies uh, in the 1880s. Um, and even though we don't know a huge amount about it, it, it's wonderful to see here on the left here, Knoxville Daily Tribune, from June 16, 1881, um, professors from UT are taking students out collecting uh, plants and doing, you know, botanical expeditions in the Smokies. It's really amazing when you think that often we talk about uh, in the 19 teens that most people considered the Smokies elsewhere and a forbidding place, and it was not easy to get to. But UT professors, uh, amongst a few other hardy fellows, and some gals, hopefully. We're exploring and um, doing kind of research there in the in 1880s. Um, then we also have Evan Alexander, which some of you may recall that Jack has talked about before. Uh, he wrote a story called The Big Smoky Mountains in uh, New York Evening Post in 1888. And then there was a one anonymous student um, from the Tennessee State University, which it, it seems like that was UT. It was just a different uh, name of the publication then. Um, Jack, you want to interject anything about Evan uh, Alexander real uh, quick? Uh, yes, and also the, just the fact that, that, that it, to underscore the fact that the Smokies were a different and uh, like almost forbidden place. It was a place that most Knoxvilleans had never been to, really, because just going to the Smokies required some trespassing. It, it required camping overnight because just getting there was often a two-day uh, adventure, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you never knew what you were going to find when you got there. Uh, you were trespassing on people's homes, trespassing on passing on on industrial sites, uh, but that's what uh, what it was like. And I've all, often said that as late as 1920, uh, more Knoxvilleans had seen had seen Times Square than had seen Cades Cove, and that's uh, that, that's literally easy easy to prove because Cade, Times Square was a lot easier to get to from downtown Knoxville than Cades Cove was. Because uh, all you had to do is get on a train and get off the train, and you're there. But uh, that it wasn't so easy to get to Cades Cove. Um, but uh, but I uh, uh, Ebenezer Alexander was a fascinating guy, and he was a guy that was born and raised on our our old uh, home, uh, Gallows Hill. In fact, in the 1850s and 60s, uh, he was a uh, I think he went to Yale, uh, but but came back and taught uh, classics at UT. 
uh, eventually uh, migrated to uh, UNC because they had a, a more investment in liberal arts than UT did at the time. UT was kind of going vocational in the 1880s, so he, he moved uh, there. But uh, remarkable for a, a guy who was very small in stature and uh, and had a heart condition that eventually killed him. He died in his 50s. Uh, but he, uh, uh, but he was a big hiker and he was a big, he would sometimes walk all the way from here to Chapel Hill, uh, which is amazing long walk, but he was an early explorer of the Smokies and was really wrote this great piece about, about getting around the Smokies as it was in, in 1888, uh, on foot, uh, mainly. Um, uh, but the, this is the same Ebenezer Alexander, by the way, that eight years later was the U S ambassador to Athens and played an important role in, in uh, starting the first uh, Olympic Games in history in 1896. Uh, he was one of the very first uh, financial contributors to the Olympics and uh, was an earlier kind of coach of the uh, of the, U the U.S. team. I think the United States had a team partly because uh, of Ebenezer Alexander's uh, influence in the Ivy League schools who sent their best athletes to Athens for that for that purpose. But you never think of a classics professor having such a big effect on on international athletics, but the, he was a, a, an exception in many ways. He, by the way, is buried at Old Gray Cemetery. And if you come to the uh, the tour on Sunday, you'll see his, his interesting grave there. It's also, okay. Jack, we were just talking a few minutes ago. It's also interesting that of the three articles right here, he's not calling it the Great Smokies. He's calling it the Big Smoky Mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this idea of the Great Smoky Mountains is still not necessarily coalesced as a, as a proper term that we know today. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I was looking into uh, the background of the 1899 movement to create a national park in the eastern United States or the southern Appalachians and uh, so surprised to come across, uh, you know, seven years earlier in 1892. There's a couple of newspaper clippings. I don't expect you to read them. Uh, you know, obviously you can't read them uh, just on the screen, but I'll highlight a couple of things. Um, you know, it says here on the left, this is in August, I'll read this one first because the, the headline's a little better. You know, a good suggestion comes to us, to the paper, uh, concerns us locally and nationally, the idea to establish a reservation in the Appalachian chain, such as the national government has established in the beautiful Yellowstone Park in Yosemite. And Yosemite comes back into the story in, back in 1923. Um, you know, it's a wonderful in this way as the Sequoia and Redwoods forests are in, in California are in their way and far more beautiful and interesting. And then actually just a few weeks earlier, magnificent timbered section, suggestion of a national park um, on the slopes of the Big Smoky. Here you go, Big Smoky again, as the name comes up, and adjacent ranges are seen in all perfection, the characteristic traces of the northern and southern states. Obviously, this was an idea that people were talking about, um, obviously inspired by the great national parks out west. Um, but it wasn't until seven years later that this National Park Convention was announced in the Asheville uh, Daily Gazette uh, in November of November 23, as you can see, 1899. Um, and I've often read that, you know, when in 1923, when the when the current you know the, the movement that we're celebrating 100 years ago coalesced, that you know it'd been you know over 20 years um, since the last major idea. And even though that's largely true. Looking through the newspaper record, uh, it's definitely there was an idea that morphed constantly over the years, but still seemed like it held on from 1899, if not 1892, all the way maybe to about 1915. It seems to like peter out a little bit after then. But um, it was formed in 1899, 1899 in Asheville by Asheville Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and they selected a group of 25 vice presidents as kind of advisors and regional representatives. And it's interesting that Professor, Professor Charles Dabney, then the current president of UT, is notably listed um, on the list of representatives. And, and the park, it, it didn't really be that specific, but it, it seemed like they were pr proposing it to be located in the in Western North Carolina region, not necessarily um, in, in Tennessee. But you know, even a, a year later, uh, the Asheville Group invited the Knoxville Chamber of Commerce to come over um, to be more involved in it. But they demurred, they def deferred. Um, in 1900, what the Knoxville Chamber of Commerce was more interested in was this idea of an army post. It was a thousand acre, as they called it, instructional camp to be purchased by Knoxville and deeded to the U.S. government. And it was going to be called Sanders Hill National Park. So uh, and this was going to be based on the ruins of the 1865 Civil War fort. 
But like many things that are, that are proposed, ultimately efforts uh, didn't come to anything. But even a, a year later, um, it was like that the, 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 the park was going to be called the Appalachian Park. That was kind of a new name that Knoxville and Asheville were, were starting to advocate again for. And even going to the, uh, you know, even within a year or two, was suggested that it might constitute about 2 million acres straddling North Carolina and Tennessee, with about three quarters of a million uh, of acres in North Carolina, so more, more in Tennessee. And they was also proposing that um, the park headquarters would be in Knoxville, and that a 35-mile road built from Knoxville to the park boundary. And, you know, this is in a time when, you know, the roads were still not good. And we'll get into that um, in, in a few minutes as well, because that's a big part of the story, automobiles and roads. Um, but, like, again, it was derailed. Uh, Secretary uh, Woodrow Wilson with the government, um, who later became president, as you know, um, he, he didn't, he wasn't able to fund uh, the investigation of, of the forest conditions uh, that the Congress were asking for. So we're going to move uh, two years uh, later, just about the, you know, the year that I was talking about, I won. And Jack, you want to talk a little, real briefly about the transition from um, President McKinley to Theodore Roosevelt? Yeah, it, it's remarkable. That, as we know, uh, uh, William McKinley, uh, who was very popular at Knoxville, by the way, came here several times, uh, was assassinated in uh, September of uh, 1901. Uh, and uh, uh, unexpectedly, his uh, kind of unpredictable vice president became president of the United States. And in his first three months of, of in office as in the White House, uh, he raised this idea of a, of, uh, as we know, he's always connected to the national parks and are, already had been. But he was proposing the idea of a, of a Southern Appalachian uh, National Park uh, or, uh, or, or, or protected area. Uh, and this is uh, these were ten key points that were uh, were were publicized in the Knoxville papers at the time about what he thought it should be. He didn't uh, lay out very clearly what where he meant this to be, but uh, it, it shows the idea was there, and uh, and he had uh, you know the basic ideas behind what made a national park uh, great that he wanted to uh, wanted to uh, apply to the to the Smokies. So these, these are just, this is the first five, and these these have been kind of reworded um, by me. But as you can see, you know, he was uh, articulating that the region comprises the highest peaks and largest mountains east of the Rockies, uh, the benefits of protecting the rainfall, um, protecting runoff from rich soils from uh, you know deforest, deforest deforestation, uh, protecting the rivers that support local agriculture agriculture and navigation. Um, and then on the second slide here, if I can advance it correctly. Um, you know, preserving these hardwoods that have unparalleled, unparalleled richness and variety. You may have heard that there's more tree species, right, in the Smokies than there is in Europe. It's, it's, it's an incredible uh, place. Um, and also the economic benefits. Uh, and there's more. And if I don't mention it later on, you know, Colonel David Chapman that we'll meet in a minute, um, you know, he was one of the Knoxville leaders that was really amazingly impressed by what he read in um, Roosevelt's report 20 odd years later. Uh, when he was involved in in the uh, in the movement, so this you know this was still going on in the, the early 1900s. So you know this eight this this idea that was born maybe in 1892, definitely in 1899, uh, was still had some um, still had some momentum in the early 1900s. And here we are, you know, one more year, a year later. This is the Knoxville Sentinel, and this is an article: um, the proposed Appalachian Park will. And do this, and they they re reiterated some of the points that uh, President Roosevelt um, stated, but also added other ones that he hadn't said, like have highlighted here. It will open up a new world to experts and science scientists, scientific men, scientists, an investigation in the wilderness, leading to the discoveries of why many nature's richest treasures, uh, and also bring strangers in the in the form of doesn't say it, but tourists. Uh, that would be another benefit to Knoxville, uh, and again. You know, um, this is interesting. We'll become a favorite land with tourists like our Yellowstone National Park and the mountains of Switzerland. Because we know, we've seen that, um, you know, Knoxville was uh, sometimes is referred to as Little Switzerland, not just the street that we know in South Knoxville, but just a general term. Um, again, here, I found the greatest varieties, the most gorgeous display of wildflowers and most picturesque scenery 
and the highest mountain peaks east of the Rockies. And this was B.R. Strong, by the way, he was the head of the, of the chamber here in Knoxville. Um, so, you know, this was a time when, and it continued really even in the early 20s, when there was this big debate whether they should have a national park or they should have a national forest. National forest would support more economic activity, national parks being, you know, more restrictive in terms of commerce. So that, that was a that was a debate that was raged on for years, really. But we also wanted to highlight the changing nature of, of downtown and also a way, of course, for somebody, at least if they could afford it, uh, to be able to get to the Smokies if there were better roads. So I'm going to turn it back to, to Jack and talk about this fellow that some of you may have already, already know, we've talked about in the past, Cowan Rogers. Uh, he was a uh, Knoxvillian. Uh, he was an inventor and built his own vehicle, probably this one that he uh, sitting in here and went down to Chattanooga. Um, and he was a co-founder of the Knoxville Automobile Club in eight, 18, uh, sorry, April 1904. Jack, yeah. hand it back over yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah. Cowan Rogers was first an athlete uh, and, uh, and Knoxville was a tennis champ and played a lot of sports in the 1890s uh, from an affluent family, but he kind of uh, rebelled a little bit and worked for a bicycle shop in, uh, in downtown Knoxville, actually in the, uh, in, the, in the most dangerous part of Knoxville, the Bowery. He worked in this bike shop and, uh, and, and tinkered all the time. And he, he built the first automobile known to have ever been seen in Knoxville in 1898 or 99. And uh, they say it scared the horses and the and the prostitutes on along uh, along Central Avenue when he he rode it back and forth uh, on the on that that inaugural first uh, first uh, uh, drive in in, in 1899 I believe uh, that uh, that uh, was the beginning of something something big he he became he decided he couldn't compete with uh, Mr Ford uh, in his uh, which was becoming famous. At the time, for his uh, his his uh, amazing uh, manufacturing processes, the assembly line and all that, uh, so he decided to be a, become a car dealer. And if you've ever heard of, uh, of of Rogers Cadillac, a lot of you are old enough to remember Rogers Cadillac. It was in business till only 15 years ago or so. It's named for him. He's the guy that started it. Uh, but he was uh, a, a major figure in Knoxville, the Chamber of Commerce. He was probably the most successful automobile dealer during his life. Uh, and uh, was uh, worked with a lot of different makes uh, over his, his career, uh, but was uh, uh, but uh, was was an early promoter of automobile and, and automobile travel, uh, which meant needing better roads because roads were just dirt roads intended for horses and bug and, and carriages, uh, and uh, automobiles needed smoother roads. Uh, so he was uh, he he founded the uh, the Nassau Automobile Club in 1904. Uh, when there were probably maybe a, you know, a couple dozen automobiles in Knoxville, um, but uh, a, a remarkable guy, and uh, was later much involved in the uh, in the Smokies as a destination uh, for automobile travel. It's kind of surprising we don't think of we think of automobiles as being the enemy of of nature, and in some ways they are. But they uh, the automobile made made this this great uh, natural resource much more visible to Knoxvillians and to people who were interested in saving it that, than they may have even uh, been aware of otherwise. But uh, anyway, yeah, uh, Cameron Rogers, a, a guy whose name should be better known, I think. His his shop, by the way, was down exactly where the dog park is, down at Central and, and Summit Hill. That's where he built the first uh, the first automobile. Next one. Uh, I'll I'll stick it on Cameron Rogers a minute, Jack. I mean, it, my notes here say that in 1904, this is the same year that the, the, the club was founded. That um, there were more there were more automobiles in Knoxville than in in cities like Memphis, Nashville, and Chattanooga, and maybe anywhere in the South. And even though they were probably low numbers, maybe Knoxville was, you know, quick out the gate because they had an inventor like Cameron Rogers. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's interesting to, to to think that the earliest drivers were were young men who were kind of athletic, like Helen Rogers, because you had to be athletic because you, you're there's a good chance you're going to have to walk back from wherever your car stopped working, and you're going to have to change a tire or two or something on the way. Uh, so it was it was not for it was not for for elderly people. It was not for for people who didn't didn't know how to how to how to how to take care of things, but. Uh, but that, it's interesting that a lot of the early drivers were early hikers too, and that's uh, that's that seems uh, that seems interesting to me. 
you might fall out of one as well. Yeah, right. exactly. Here's a little clipping from 1905. This is about a year later or just under a year later. And it says, although Knoxville streets and the pike roads leading out of the city are not as perfect as they should be, there are so many attractive objective points in close proximity to the city, that motoring must constantly grow in favour. It kind of slowed down a little bit, actually. The, the, the kind of club kind of almost disbanded within a year. Uh, but, it, but it bounced back in 1906 uh, when there was apparently 70 automobiles owned in Knoxville. Um, and one of the places they like to go to is Strawberry Plains. They presumably get into Strawberry Plains or in Strawberry Plains area um, because it was kind of a flat topography. Um, that was that was a big driver of, of a place where they um, they like to drive. But they, you know they did. Cave and Karen, Karen Rogers himself said that the many hills and climbs add interest to the trips and serve to bre break the monotony. That is bound to result from a spring spin along a perfectly level country road. And here's another one here. Automobile in Knoxville is in May of 1906. Automobile in Knoxville is to be taken up with more interest than ever. Steps are now being made to reorganize the club and to revive the interest, which died out to a certain extent owing to the condition of roads. So obviously roads was just a big deal, you know, around Knoxville. And probably, uh, you know, undoubtedly, uh, was a factor in, in people spending a lot, probably a lot of money. Again, the only people could afford roads for people who could afford it. Um, it changed into the Knoxville Automobile Association in 1909 uh, with kind of different leadership. Um, it was about about 100 members, uh, you know, by that time. Let's see what's next. Well, we we came up with a couple of pictures. This is probably around about 1910, I guess. Um, I'm sure, all of you will be familiar with this. Uh, this spot uh, today, you know, it's Gay Street uh, with the little uh, intersection with Union Avenue and the old Miller's uh, building, as you can see, just left of center. But you can see, you know, pretty early cars on the left. You've got, uh, we call those, those whole uh, little horse driven cabs or the hacks, maybe they called them. And you've got the street lines going down the center of the road. Knoxville, life in Knoxville was changing, definitely on the sidewalk. And even within about 1920, um, maybe you've got a couple of horses still there, but uh, anything you want to comment on those, Jack? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, it's amazing to think of uh, all these different kinds of conveyances sharing the road because there were, there were uh, electric streetcars down the way. You see there are tracks there as well and, and uh, bicyclists uh, all over the place and pedestrians. There are probably five different kinds of of ways of getting around. Uh, and when people talk about these roads were made for cars, well, that's not true for the, the old part of Knoxville. They, they were, uh, they were, they had all, all kinds of uh, different, uh, different ways of getting around. But yeah, cars were catching, really catching on uh, by, uh, especially by 1920. So many of you will be familiar with Colonel David Chapman. Later he was called the father of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park because, you know, arguably he did so much um, he's just a powerhouse in what, what he was able to do. And we'll talk about some of his uh, exploits later. But uh, he was a, a you know fairly uh, early member of the Knoxville Automobile Club. He was definitely supportive. He uh, was very active with Cameron Rogers uh, in those early days of the club. Of course, his, uh, he was the, it was the son of John Ellis Chapman, who established Chapman White and, drug, and Lyons Drug Company uh, here on, on State, on Gay Street, on the 200 block, which is you know, um, where that new statue is going in at the uh, country, both the country music uh, park right now. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. But um, he, he was, um, he, he, he be, was later called Colonel because he was very involved in the military, he began his career in the Spanish American War in 1898, uh, later served as uh, aide of camp to Brigadier General Colby, who was a veteran of the Civil War and American Indian Wars. Um, and then he was eventually promoted to lieutenant colonel during World War One. That's where the colonel comes from. But as I said, he, he was a, he was a big civic uh, advocate of, of good roads, uh, of automobiles. Um, but he was involved in all types of things. He was the president of the Knoxville Board of Trade, um, the first president of the Knoxville Rotary Club. Um, just a, kind of a, a energy a energizer, Bonnie. Really, probably in the early 1900s, yeah. you would say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, it, it, despite his appearance, but he looks very mild mannered, and he was not a he was a not a tall guy uh, too. But but he was a uh, 
he was a, a, a really aggressive driven guy that, that everybody remarked about that that he was that he was he wanted to get things done and didn't didn't care what was what was in his way that was what his uh, kind of approach to the problems is and the the creation of a national park was a was a major problem that needed somebody like uh, like Chapman yeah, I mean, he was really fiercely focused on, you know, economic activity, boosterism, trying to make the city grow. Uh, in the early 1900s, he was pushing this idea of, um, you know, a big exposition, uh, which kind of came to, to be, you know, uh, his idea, we guess, was a little bit ahead of time. But by 1910, we did host the first two or three, um, well, two Appalachian expositions in 1910 and 1913, uh, 1910 and 1911. Jack, you want to expand on these? Yeah, this uh, of course, this uh, building is still there at Chill Howie Park, uh, but this was the first uh, the first big exposition in Knoxville in 1910, and it had a, a bit of a conservation undertone, and, and a lot of people involved in this. Uh, well, some of them were artists and and uh, other kinds of people, but it was uh, uh, it was it was uh, uh, the first of three uh, big expositions here that had something to do with the fact that we were near the the uh, the, the mountains. And you see the name, the word Appalachian, you don't see that a lot in the 19th century, but in the early 20th century, people are starting to look at the Appalachians and it, will this be part of Knoxville's destiny to be to be associated with the Appalachian mountains. Um, but uh, I'm glad we still have that. That's the only building surviving of, of, of more than a dozen buildings that were built for the uh, those original expositions. Um, really, some really huge, beautiful buildings that have all either burned down or been torn down over the years. Um, but uh, but the, you could talk about that. All, all of them were fascinating. But uh, but that was that was a big deal. And it's interesting to see these names like that of David Chapman, who were involved in these uh, expositions in 1910, and how they would be working together again in the 1920s. Um, and here they are, you know, in, in 1910, talking about um, good roads again uh, throughout throughout the ex expedition, or they were planning to, and then and then one next year in 1911. So. Automobiles and big and, and roads really were very pivotal, and it's hard to imagine the 1923 Smokies movement being successful, obviously, without automobiles and roads together. It, sounds, it seems obvious to us in the future. And here we are in 1911 as well. Uh, what everyone should know about Knoxville is the logical point for location of the Appalachian Park at headquarters. So this, Nate, this concept of an Appalachian Park is still going strong. It's 12 years later after Asheville, and yet some people seem to have written it off. Kind of interesting to me. But what else happened in 1911? Um, so somebody, I guess in Blunt County, this was a surprise to us. Blunt County came together and a bunch of people in, in, of landowners said that they would contribute the 5,000 acres in Blunt County and give it to the government so President uh, Taft could have his own summer White House. And they were going to place this 6,500 feet above sea level near Gregory's Ball. Well, Gregory's Bowl, I guess. I mean, if this, this is, I mean, if I'm reading this correctly, it's kind of very hard to, to imagine yeah. uh, that. And yeah. one of the things that they offered was to build him an inclined ra railroad to get him there. I didn't realize this, but Jack said he was quite a hefty fellow, as you can maybe get a little <laughs> glimpse of him here yeah. in his Knoxville visit on the right. It, it, it was probably unlikely to hike uh, uh, Gregory Bowl, but. Uh... Yeah, I, I'm not sure the typesetter was 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 on the ball, so to speak, uh, uh, that that day. Because you see, I, I noticed on my on my typewriter, uh, 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 Z and W are not too, or Z and X are, are not too far away, or actually the next door to each other. So, um, but uh, Nosville um, and uh, and Gregory Ball, they probably just heard that and just oh, yeah, wrote Nosville. Ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were well, some... uh, journalists. There was something else happening about this time, wasn't there, Jack, that we're going to uh, switch to here uh, or move along here? The Appalachian Club. So Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that the we'll Appalachian that. Club, yeah, in, in Elkmont. And Elkmont was uh, was was something that grew out of uh, of, of a, a surprising evolution of, uh, of what had been a workers camp for lumbermen working for uh, Colonel Townsend up in the up in the up in the mountains. Uh, and uh, as he moved to different camps they evacuated one camp and moved to an, built another one uh but they they left this one up here and and uh townsend had this idea to uh put passenger cars on his lumber train which was a purely industrial train for a while but uh took passengers up there and 
the passengers that went up there were people of his uh, uh, social class. They were Knoxville's elite uh, who uh, who went up there, and and some of them liked these shacks and moved into them. Kind of went slumming a bit, and some it fixed them up a little bit in some cases. But that became what we know as is Elkmont. Um, and uh, this was another this was uh, a, another way to get to the mountains, uh, but just that part of the mountains. It was the the you know trains didn't go everywhere. There was a train that went to Gatlinburg and a train that went to Elkmont sometimes. And it was just occasionally that like the uh, Elkmont special just ran on Sundays, you know, and that was and didn't run all year. It was just during the summer mainly. But that's how a lot of people got there and back. And here's the swimming hole at Elkmont. Uh, and by the way, th this was beloved to generations of Knoxvillians. And uh, if you read Tennessee Williams' memoirs, he uh, his family were an Altmont family. And when, even though he lived in Mississippi and later St. Louis, uh, they would come here for the summer. And he had these you know these vivid memories of childhood uh, swimming in the Altmont swimming hole. Um, so it's a uh, it it was just part of the the culture of kind of an upper middle class uh, uh, group of people who were many of whom were in, involved in the Smoky Mountains. And a lot of these people were people like the Davises, we'll talk about in a little bit, who were uh, who were regulars at Elkmont and later became leaders of the National Park Movement. All right, this is uh, back to Chihuahua Park. Uh, the, the, the national, the only conservation exposition in history, in global history, uh, it, I've, I've heard it said, and I've never found a, an exception to it, was in Knoxville in 1913. And this was a very big deal, lasted for two months at Jolly Park. Uh, this was, uh, uh, th th this, uh, it was a, an exposition devoted to the idea of conserving our natural resources. Of course, they had rides and crazy freak shows and things too, but, but they had, uh, but conservation was the emphasis and uh, was, uh, was, was, it was a big deal. One million Americans came to this exposition and, over two months in, uh, in fall of, of 1913. It was a very, a very big deal. And again, people like David Chapman and uh, several of the other leaders of the future uh, National Park Movement uh, were there, uh, kind of in mid middle management or something, they were there at the, uh, at the big fair. This was the biggest exposition in Knoxville, the biggest event of any kind before the 1982 World's Fair. Anything else, Paul? Yeah, we have the Mountain View Hotel. Is this the right place? Uh, yeah, that's that, well, that's a good place for it. Yeah, what uh, I think with nineteen eighteen uh, in Gatlinburg, that was another uh, another entry, another evidence of interest in the Smokies, which had been this distant and kind of foreboding place, uh, thanks to automobiles partly, and thanks to, also to the little train that went up up near there. Uh, the Mountain View Hotel became a became a thing and became a way for. Uh, Knoxvilleans to get to the Smokies uh, uh, more easily and and to and to start seeing what what a great uh, a, a wonderful resource they they are, um, but that's uh, but that's part of the story as well. Gatlinburg is 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 part of the story as, as is Elmont. Next one, please. Yeah, so now we're about to get into the you know this almost a hundred years ago, this movement in 1923 and how that started. But we're just going to pause a moment and just kind of recognize people that we know of that were going to the Smokies, you know, between 1890s and 1923. Let's just look at a few people here. Some names of you will know, others you may not. But um, of course, Harry Imes is no surprise. He was a great uh, supporter of the outdoors. He was a naturalist. He was a commercial artist. But for my, you know, and I've researched quite a bit and written about the Imes family, but he would he, he was going to the Smokies in the eight, in 1894 is the earliest record that I know. That's pretty early uh, compared to most of the other regulars that we associate with the uh, movement for the Smokies in the 1920s and 1930s. The guy next to him, I'd love to, we'd love to know much more about him. Um, he was a professor of botany at UT. He was a photo photographer. Um, but beyond that, we don't really know much about him. Um, there is an Essary Street or Road in Fountain City. Is it named after him? I'd love to know that. Uh, if anyone has any idea about him. Um, one of the things that uh, is enduring for him is if you are familiar with uh, Horace Kepot's book, Our Southern Highlanders, at least the reprint this thing's been out for several decades now. Uh, the cover of the chimney tops was photographed by, by Samuel Essary. So his, 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 his artistry is definitely uh, still being seen by hundreds of thousands of people a year. Of course, we've done talks on Jim Thompson, uh, the most prolific photographer probably in the history of the city. 
Um, he was, you know, probably about 1915, going into the Smokies on his own, photo- taking photographs of flowers and, and stuff for his mom, who couldn't make it there. And of course, um, the Smoky, the Great and Smoky Mountains National Park would not exist really without him. And we'll pick up his story shortly. Uh, you may be familiar with the, may not be familiar with Mary Pomeroy Graves. You may know Mary Palm Claiborne, who works for the Knox County Public Library. This is, uh, I think, her, gr- her grandmother or something like that, if I'm correct. Um, she and another lady hiked Mount Leconte. I think it's the first females that we know of hiking in the Smokies, hiking Mount Leconte uh, in the summer of 1916. And they left this little piece of mirror on one of the trees, um, which was later verified that that's how they knew that they had hiked it. So I uh, wanted to recognize her. We've covered her in a couple of other programs over the years. Um, great suggestion by Jack here. Uh, Charles Crouch, you may have seen some of his paintings around uh, at the Clung Collection downtown, also at the Knoxville Museum of Art, on some of the art wraps that we've done around town. He was painting in the early 1910s yeah, and later they, became they, known as Corot of the South. Yeah, they, they, they say that he would just dis- disappear. He was he was an organist. He had a job as an organist for Episcopal Church downtown, and but it would just take off. He was single. He would just take off and live in the Smokies for a while. And we'd come back with these amazing canvases that uh, these places that looked exotic and people would would buy them for their house, but may not have been daring enough to actually go up and see where he painted them. Uh, but interesting, he was known for for if he saw a cabin, he would he would not include it. He would paint it as if the cabin was not there. It was a pure he wanted things to look purely natural. Uh, but he was still painting into the early 1930s when he when he died. He, he was born son of German immigrants back in the uh, late 1840s. So fascinating, eccentric family. Uh, but next to him is uh, Robert Lindsay Mason, also a very interesting artist. And it's interesting how today we think about old neighborhoods as first being occupied by artists. And uh, I think the same thing happened to the Smokies in some ways. Uh, that these uh, these kind of daring artists who just wanted to go there to to uh, to uh, behold a scene. Uh, but these were all professional artists, and there weren't many of them in Knoxville. But they all had something to do with the Smokies, and it kind of caused a a little bit of a renaissance in art in Knoxville in the 1920s, because people were bringing back these canvases of, of, of the Smokies, people like Robert Lindsay Mason, who uh, by 1912, I think, was taking groups up to paint in the Smokies. In 1917, he gave a talk about his adventures in uh, painting in the Smokies to the Nicholas and Art League, who had never had any member do anything like quite like that, except for Charles Crouch. Um, but uh, and of course Harvey Broom, uh, 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 very in, in, uh, nationally influential, with the uh, is one of the founders of the Wilderness Society later on. But he was just a a young guy. Uh, was he was was he uh, uh, what was he doing in 1917? Paul, he was a young lad, really, being introduced yeah. by his family into the Smokies. Yeah, just just by just camping hikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and pretty much same with Paul Adams too. We'll meet again Paul in a few minutes. A few minutes, but you may recall his dog, Smoky Jack or Cumberland Jack, as his proper name was. Um, you may probably be more familiar with that story. Um, talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. You, you could talk about him on a separate program. But um, these people were out there hiking the Smokies way before it was become a national park. And we also wanted to highlight. Two or three people, or three here, that are not from Knoxville, but I don't think you can really tell the Smoky story without them acknowledging that Horace Kephart was this brilliant librarian that had a lot of personal problems um, and then moved here, I think, from Kentucky, um, it, it, you know, in the early 1900s uh, to, to, uh, to convalesce. He was an alcoholic and had mental issues, but, um, you know, lived here, got to know the terrain got to know the local people, wrote this amazing book, Our, Our Southern Highlanders. It was published, I think, in 1913, uh, still in print today. And, um, you know, if you wanted to uh, say who was a, a, an authority on living, on understanding and appreciating and wanting to preserve as a feminine outsider's perspective, uh, Horace Kepa is probably one of the earliest names that you would recite. Uh, locally, even though he's from Knoxville, uh, wasn't from Knoxville, Paul Fink was known in Knoxville, he was from Jonesboro, uh, by the early 20s, he was, he was again, he was an, another authority um, from an Oxford perspective and maybe from North Carolina too, um, on the Smokies and also was was even ahead of, of the Davises, who we'll speak about in just a minute, uh, was advocating that a national park could be built around Malacont, I think in like 1921, 1922. 
And of course, if you've seen, um, you know, the Ken Burns documentary where Jim Thompson's uh, photographs were mentioned, uh, George Master, um, you know, fr from um, from Japan and came and, and uh, you know moved from I think San Francisco to uh, to Asheville. And it was just an amazing photographer like Jim Thompson. Um, you know, he, he even the 1920s was came an advocate for protecting the Smokies and was involved with the nomenclature committees and and the Appalachian Trail, as, as Kephart were, and, and a whole bunch of others from Knoxville as well. Um, again, not from Knoxville, which is our focus, of course, as an organization, but definitely these people were known by Knoxvillians, befriended and worked on some of these committees, and certainly uh, honorable mentions nonetheless. Jack, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about this lady, Annie yeah. Davis. And Annie Davis was uh, it was this whole the, the the first idea that got traction was her idea, uh, and it came just to, with a conversation with her husband, uh, in uh, in in 1923. Um, but she was from uh, she was from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, they moved here when her husband got work with the uh, as as head of the Knoxville Iron Company, one of our biggest factories in town. Uh, but they they lived here uh, in the late teens and immediately became uh, in, in, infatuated with the Smoky Mountains. Uh, began going to Elkmont in those early days. Uh, they were they were uh, 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 part of the uh, group of people who went to Elkmont. I can't remember whether they're members of the Appalachian Club or the uh, the rival Wonderland Club. Uh, but uh, but they were they were regulars up there. Uh, and uh, it was in 1923 when she and her husband went out west to visit uh, Yosemite, I believe, and uh, said, isn't this a great idea? Uh, yeah, here it is. I, she can say it better than I, I can. Uh, we have seen some beautiful country and grand mountains, but nothing more beautiful and majestic than our own Great Smokies. Why then should there be national parks in the west and only one small national park in the eastern half of the United States? I think that park was in May, a tiny place in Maine. Um, why should our own Great Smokies be made a national park? Well, that was a, a what seems like a simple request of her husband, but uh, uh, yeah. her husband Willis Davis, a very resourceful fellow, uh, was one of the few people who could get this ball rolling. He said, "If you, if that is the way you feel about it, I will see what I can do." That's a good husband, isn't it? Uh, uh, but he was uh, he was uh, a guy with uh, with connection, money, and connections to money. He was uh, he was also a very uh, a uh, very gentlemanly fellow. They say he was he was he was just a, a very kind, gentlemanly guy. Uh, people who didn't like him said he was a bore because he would just go on and on about things that he he wanted to do. Especially in the last ten years of his life, he couldn't talk about anything but the Smoky Mountains. They say and just had as much as he, he would talk about him as as much as he could. Uh, but he was the guy that uh, that kind of got really got things going. Uh, even before Chapman was really the leader of it, uh, uh, Willis Davis was 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 right there and pushing the the the, uh, the ball hard in ways that we'll see we'll see more specifically in a minute. But uh, Davis, uh, they have a, a, a I think a ridge or something named for them in the in the Smokies. They're they're remembered, but not as well remembered as they they should be. Davis uh, uh, David Chapman said that. Willis Davis should have a monument in Knoxville uh, for for the uh, the major efforts that he he accomplished in in building the park. Which, as you see with his dates, he didn't actually live to see uh, the park uh, formally open. Of course, it, the park was had trails in it. I think even had a ranger by 1931, but was was not really uh, celebrated as the uh, national park that it that it was and that it became in the 1930s. Uh, next it really one. should be the father of the Great Smoky Mountains, shouldn't he? Rather than Chapman, perhaps in a way. In in, in a way, I mean, he was he was the very first one. I, I think Chapman did a, a lot, a whole lot more hard work than anybody else did, uh, probably in in the 1920s and early 30s. But uh, but but Willis Davis was was the very he was the godfather. We'll call him the godfather of the, of the Smoky Mountains. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing to me that you know he would. <laughs> He said to his wife, that's the way you do. I will see what I can do about it. You know, probably in June, by by Christmas, that they had an organization. I mean, it was amazing. Within five or six months, he did his work. And the next clipping we will see here, um, he would, you know, he it's in the newspapers. He's he's already been, he's already sold the idea to J. Will Taylor, who's the congressman from Tennessee's second district. 
to be to advocate this in Congress in the next session of Congress. And this is what November the second. This is what less than two weeks away from a hundredth anniversary. Yeah, um, yeah. Wherever you want to put the flag in, you know, we're in that ballpark right now. Yeah, yeah. Taylor was uh, was our, our part of our unbroken chain of Republican congressmen since the, the Civil War. He was not a Knoxvilleian. He was from Loudoun County, I believe. Uh, but he had a, uh, a uh, 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 yeah, Mount Davis. Uh, thanks, Cindy. I was trying to remember. There's a, a Davis Ridge, but also a, a Mount Davis. And I think they may be named for uh, husband and wife. Um, but uh, J. Will Taylor was uh, uh, from Loudoun County, but he had his election headquarters on Market Square. And he kept it at the old uh, Gold Sun uh, Cafe that uh, was the Greek run cafe on the on the corner there that some some people may remember. Uh, so he was a guy that he was the face we saw a lot here, uh, but he got immediately interested in uh, in Davis and the the Davises, I should say, idea. Um, by the way, the Davises, uh, a little bit surprisingly, considering they were pretty wealthy, uh, were living in an apartment building in Fort Sanders at the time that they made this proposal. The, uh, uh, the Laurel Terrace Apartments, which are still there and still apartments on the corner of uh, Laurel and 17th Street, is where they lived. They later lived in uh, on. Lies view in a bigger house uh, that from which they could see the Smoky Mountains, um, but uh, but they were uh, 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 that's where they lived. And, and W. P. Davis, by the way, uh, Knoxville Iron Company was in Lonsdale at the time, and is still sort of there. It's now uh, uh, called something else. It's a it's a they make steel rebar, but it's the same plant uh, that uh, that he knew when he was uh, uh, founding the the uh, the. Great Smoky Mountain Conservation Association and all that, but uh, anyway, yeah, he was—he knew what to do. He knew politicians. He knew they would be key to all this, and he knew that he was going to have to meet somebody really important uh, in Washington, and that was the Secretary of the Interior under Coolidge, uh, Hubert Work. Hubert Work, by the way, had a was in kind of an awkward position uh, because he was the Secretary of the Interior who uh, succeeded uh, Albert Fall, who you may remember from. Uh, from history was disgraced uh, as for his role in orchestrating the Teapot Dome scandal of the Harding administration. Uh, Hubert Work was his immediate predecessor. It was never associated with uh, with anything, uh, any scandal like that. But uh, but he was the guy that would have been in charge of of making uh, uh, you know connecting you to a na creating a national park. And Davis went up and met him just almost as soon as uh, as he got this this ball rolling and in Knoxville um, and uh, to, to, to get be sure that not only the legislative net level, but the executive level knew about this and was was ready to respond to it. And uh, you see the movements well underway and and uh, just before Christmas in 1923, this is the uh, establishment of the Smoky Mountain uh, uh, National Park, uh, the, the Smoky Mountains Conservation Association which is became a kind of a key uh, central organization for founding the park. Um, and uh, Willis Davis was was the guy that that uh, that founded it. Uh, we have is the next one uh, the uh, the people who were actually involved in it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah. been said that someone could come up with the idea for it as an idea, but they needed an organization to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. This was, uh, th these are all interesting people. You see Willis Davis on the left, we've already talked about him, and Colonel David Chapman uh, was uh, next. Uh, Cowan Rogers, we talked about him. Uh, Judge uh, Daniel Clary Webb uh, was uh, was a prominent guy. If he looks a little bit uh, a little bit like uh, our old friend, Bob Webb, who founded Webb School and, and died just a few years ago, uh, it's not coincidental because that that's his father. Uh, Daniel Clary Webb uh, was, uh, prominent judge whose office was in the Burwell building. And another uh, guy whose office was in the Burwell building was Judge Hugh Lindsay. Uh, and it was in his office that they got together and founded the Great Smoky Mountains National, uh, Great Smoky, Smoky Mountains Conservation Association in uh, in 19, uh, December of 1923. And that centennial is coming up very soon. Uh, but these were the the guys, and and uh, there are other people. Wiley Brownlee, who was from Gatlinburg, uh, who was secretary, uh, but later, uh, soon after, resigned. Uh, Forrest Andrews, and James B. Wright, who became kind of a, a, a complicated figure in the whole history because he really was more interested in in making him a national forest uh, that could be uh, could be uh, exploited 
uh, and the uh, he was outvoted on this committee, obviously. But um, uh, but that but that was the the key. If there was a birthplace of the uh, of the whole park movement, it was in that lawyer's office on the top of the Burwell Building on uh, on Gay Street. And of course, uh, that that building is still with us. Uh, this building was this picture was taken just after that. This is the Tennessee Theater Building. That's the same building. Uh, the Burwell Building, though, when they had the meeting, was just the part on the left. Because when they built the Tennessee Theater in 1928, they built they, they greatly expanded the building. It was just uh, three windows across uh, when they had that that uh, crucial critical meeting in 1923. Um, but that's uh, that's 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 the Burwell Building, and and I think it deserves a deserves a plaque or something on it because that's the the birthplace of this of this whole effort. Next one, please. All right. Yeah, we're gonna uh, we're gonna move along. Uh, well, yeah. You want me to talk about Joe? Yeah, go go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So July nineteen twenty four. You know, six months after the association was founded, um, the Southern uh, Appalachian National Park Commission was already very active, looking at different locations around the southeast for a new national park. And of course, everyone, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, they all had their own ideas of where a national park might possibly go. And of course, the contingent in Knoxville and the broader contingent that they were talking to, probably even in North Carolina at that point, was um, was trying, you know, was trying to suggest the Smokies. But the Park Commission weren't interested in the Smokies at that point. They were very interested. Their top contenders actually were Grandfather Mountain in North Carolina, part of the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Um, but somehow Colonel Chapman managed to wangle this opportunity where even though they weren't going to go to the Smokies, the commission wasn't going to go and visit the Smokies, they would at least meet with the Knoxville contingent. So Chapman, it turns out, had this kind of brilliant idea. And th this has been well written about and well documented. But to get Jim Thompson, this brilliant photographer who'd been out and documented the Smokies, he said, put every of your best photographs that are framed in the back of your car, drive your car, to the Grove Park Inn in, in Asheville, and we're going to try and douse off the committee. So that's what J Jim Thompson did. And it was really a stroke of genius. In fact, it was almost too good. The, the commission mem uh, commission, com committee members felt that, were, the, were these actually, some of these photographs real? But, um, and you know, people who have been uh, delving into the history of the Smokies, uh, the Smokies movement have often wondered which photographs did he take? Well, we don't really know, but I guess we could hazard a guess even though a lot of uh, Thompson's photographs weren't dated, but he was probably, you know, some of these old photographs, you know, from, from the late teens or early 20s that he'd been doing of, of the chimney, South Chimney from North Chimney, um, just evocative photographs of the rugged terrain in the Smokies. Um, actually, I've got the wrong caption here. I think this is looking over from Mount Conte over to Newfound Gap. Um, definitely here uh, in the clouds on... Uh, I to read my um, captions with my little navigation bar here, but uh, here we go. Yeah, between the class from Myrtle Point, um, which it was going to be, that was going to be a view where the commission members could hopefully see themselves if they actually got them to the Smokies. Um, what do we have next? Uh, approaching Timney Tops. Um, you know, just th these were probably, hopefully, some of the photographs that the, he set on these easels or set around the room to, to get the attention of the, of the commission uh, members. Uh, Mill Creek on the way to Mount Kant, just beautiful, gorgeous photographs. I mean, imagine seeing these for the first time. And later in seven years, as Thompson Photograph uh, Company had their, you know, shops on Gay Street, these were in many windows. It was almost like a permanent exhibit on Gay Street. But, um, yeah, in, in, you know, within a, a few a few weeks, I mean, what happened was is that the commissioners were so wowed by these photographs that they agreed to come to Knoxville. They came to the, uh, on the Southern Street the Southern Station and came and uh, checked into the Farragut Hotel. Jack, you want to say a few things about the Farragut before we... Yeah, yeah the, the, the Farragut Hotel uh, alongside the Burwell, which is, it is literally alongside the Burwell, what is another uh, important uh, site in the history of the, uh, the Smoky Mountains uh, organization, uh, because uh, this is where all the people from the Department of the Interior in Washington and uh, the National Park Service would come uh, to meet, uh, sometimes to stay overnight, but sometimes just to meet in the lobby before they would get in cars and drive up to Gatlinburg and go uh, deeper into the Smokies. Uh, but a lot of things happened in the in the Farragut Hotel, including uh, the, uh, the the meetings of the Rotary Club. Uh, a lot of the, the fraternal organizations in town, especially the Rotary Club, 
Why? Because guess who the founder of the Rotary Club in Knoxville was? It was David Chapman. And he made sure that the Rotary Club of Knoxville was, was way behind this, was get, getting right behind the whole Smoky Spark idea. And this, this idea was pitched in, a lot, in countless meetings of the Rotary Club at the uh, Farragut Hotel, which is now known as High Place. But I'm glad that the word Farragut is still there, that the one that Farragut is on the facade too. But that's one of the, uh, another, a co birthplace of the, uh, of the movement. It's right there. And here's a photograph of um, a couple of the park commissioners in, in Chapman as well. Um, yeah. Outside the Farragut Hotel, the Burwell Building is on the right. And of course, Chapman, you know, was the head of the Conservation Association, was charged with, you know, organizing this guided trip to take them, you know, in this caravan all the way over to the Smokies um, to see the park personally. And hopefully that that would lead them to make it to, to decide that, yes, the Smokies is, is, is really the place where this new national park should go. Um, here's a zoomed in photograph, a really interesting photograph, this actually. Interestingly, the Keystone Film Company that volunteered to, uh, or maybe even we were going to be paid to, um, to film. And apparently they did. They accompanied this contingent to the Smokies and filmed it. But the, the footage was lost, or they never delivered it. There was a court battle, but that footage, as far as we know, whether it's still out there, has never been seen. Um, and we don't really, I don't have any photographs of that trip, but um, we certainly, um, Chapman was the ringleader. Uh, he had identified the Manview Hotel. That was a picture that we just looked at that Jack was talking about in Gatlinburg, where the party would stay. Um, and he uh, organized uh, a Paul Adams, who we met just a few minutes ago, to be the trail guide. Again, Paul Adams, as a fairly young lad, had been obsessed with hiking and exploring and camping on his own in the Smokies. So as a young man, he was really a very, uh, from, from Knoxville, was a very experienced trail guide. Um, and he was hired by Colonel Chapman um, while he was working at Crouch Florist, Brockway Crouch, as a business on the corner of Gay and Church, essentially where the uh, the Robo statue is today. Um, and he didn't, this is Smokey Jack. You know, this is a famous dog that had these saddlebags, as you can see in the photograph. That was the next year in 1925 is when he got Com uh, Cumberland Jack. Um, but he had a previous dog and um, even old, uh, uh, the the editor, the very old editor, uh, William Rawl of the, of the Knoxville Journal, which had, you know, in the journal building across the street, um, used to love and come and pet Paul Adams' dog. But Paul was really uh, was instrumental, as long with like Wiley Oakley um, and others, to, to lead this group up uh, from, you know, Orchard Grove in um, both Gatlinburg, uh, up Rainbow Falls Trail um, to camp the first night on Mount LeConte and then go down uh, the other side onto Allen Cave. I mean, there were no trails really. They're not the trails that we see today. If you go up Mount Con, it's it's a pretty it's pretty hard hike, isn't it? Uh, there were no trails. They were probably fighting, uh, you know, rhododendron, briar, and everything else. So, um, you know, ahead of myself there. But if they really, it was a very difficult uh, expedition. Uh, even Willis Davis um, got injured on it coming down um, off the peak of Mount Con uh, near uh, Allen Cave and had to be stretched out. Um, but it. Everyone uh, from the commission was just really blown away by the Smokies and they realized that Jim Thompson's photographs were not fake, they were real. And it was just an amazing, fantastic area. And not too long afterwards, the Smokies was recommended as a location to be in the National Park. And that's really when the work began. This wasn't like they were gonna set aside these vast tracts of, of forested area to become a National Park. They had to be it was six six thousand six hundred different parcels of land that had to be acquired, and that's really why Colonel Chapman is called, um, you know, the father of the national park because he was essentially a bulldog and you know and, and fought uh, amazingly hard over many many years to make it all happen. And as Carlos Campbell said in in his book that was written in 1960, Birth of a National Park, that there were just hundreds of times when the whole thing could have caved in and the whole dream to have a national park uh, would have been over um but it really another pivotal moment was this this expedition into the smokies now we're going to move a, a couple uh, the following year in 1925 
And Jack's going to pick up the story with Annie Davis as a member yeah. of the Tennessee House of Representatives. Yeah, yeah. Annie Davis didn't just have a great idea and then and then ease into the background, as you might expect of a woman in the 1920s. Uh, uh, but she was uh, they had the vote, but many women weren't used to taking the lead in big projects. But she she was an exception. She ran for public office and was elected to, uh, to, to represent Knox County in the state legislature. And her number one, she had some some uh, uh, women's issues that she wanted to deal with, but she also uh, had uh, was her main project was the national park, uh, and she was pushing uh, Tennessee to uh, to accept this idea, to uh, to contribute to it, to actually uh, eventually purchase a major part of what became uh, the uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, but a, a, an amazing woman who's uh, who's who's who should be much much better known than than she is. Um, but uh, Bryn Mawr grad, by the way, uh, uh, was uh, was uh, it kind of stood out in a lot of ways. Uh, she uh, lived in Knoxville with her husband. Uh, I think she was living on Lions View by the time she was a re representative. Uh, but later, after her husband's death, she moved to Gatlinburg just to be closer to the to the to the park, and lived there a long time. Uh, so Jack, she was instrumental in presenting this bill to acquire what seventy-eight thousand acres, seventy-six or seventy-eight thousand yeah, yeah. acres that belonged yeah. to the Little River Railroad. Yeah, and it failed in the House the first time, the first vote. And she had this great idea that she would um, encourage and kind of rally every all well, the legislators to come to the Smokers. And here we have a great photograph. I've never seen this one before today <laughs> for the McClung collection of the legislators yeah. in Townsend boarding the train or getting off. One of the two. Um, and that I was think just we a should, really pivotal moment. I, I, I think we should do that again. It might improve their perspective <laughs> on things. But uh, and what happened? It was successful. Yeah, yeah. Austin P was governor, and uh, and 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 finally signed the bill. Um, and uh, very influential governor. Uh, and uh, and and there there they were. She was. He invited her to come witness it. That's her on the on the left. Yeah, right here. Third from the left. Yeah. Of course, around about this time, there was this notion that um, I think it was the federal government or the, said that, you know, to establish the park, that 300, um, 300 acres had to, uh, 300,000 acres, right, had to be acquired for the park to, to, to exist. But Colonel Chapman um, kind of helped him talk them down to about 150,000, which made it much more manageable. So in, this is from 1927. By the way, this is uh, one of those fold-out maps that you could get in the back little envelope pocket of the, of the Smoky Mountain Hiking Club uh, in would have been 1928. This is an illustration by um, Harry Iams of what the proposed Great Smoky Mountains would have looked like. And you can see on the left there, hotels and camps. Uh, this is kind of a, more of a serious drawing than Harry Iams often did, but um, really gives you a good sense of it, of this... You know, what, what was envisioned as the Appalachian Park became Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And people were hiking it, uh, clearly, in 1927. Uh, even though before it was official, people were enjoying it and experiencing it and developing trails. And, of course, a big part of the story is, and this was something that Colonel Chapman was heavily involved in personally and, and close up, was that this big obstacle of what to do with the mountain folk that lived there. They'd grown up there. They'd lived there from generations. They didn't want to leave. They didn't buy into this notion of, yes, we've just got to evacuate and all the tourists would come in flooding in. And this is a sign that Colonel Chapman was faced uh, in Cades Cove. I can't remember the year, but I think it was late 20s, early 30s. He says, Colonel Chapman, you and host uh, notify um let the let, let the cove and people all one get out get gone and 40 m limit i think that's 40 miles stay away 40 <laughs> miles yeah and by the way there were just some of the of the uh between five and six thousand people were 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 moved from to make the room for the uh for the smokies and some of them were happier than others about the deal that uh, that they cut with them chapman claimed that he tried to be fair with uh, and, and give them a good a good price i don't know whether uh whether research would uh would would prove that or not but uh but they it was a major 
moving of people. We did that a lot. I think we'll remember in the, in the future that in the 20th century, we moved people around a lot. Uh, um, uh, so in, in, with urban renewal and, uh, and uh, the TVA projects and, and other things. Yeah, some of the some of the mountain settlers were um, they they were off they 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 had to either sell at full market price or sell at a lower price with the right to live in their homes on a lifetime lease. Tough situation. Yeah. But Ch Chapman was um, pretty instrumental in another big way, wasn't he, Jack? That this idea was to, uh, with Colonel Chapman, along with uh, Arno, Arno Camera, who was then assistant director of the National Park Service, um, to solicit a large gift from John D. Rockefeller Jr., um, who, who had met with Camera uh, several, several times on their many trips to Washington, D.C. Uh, and New York on, on park business. Uh, and even though um, Chapman wasn't the you know, the guy that actually made the ask, he re really was commended um, with the success of it. And um, they they asked John D. Rockefeller Jr. for $5 million, which was, was essentially a matching gift that helped uh, the Smokies become a certainty. Um, and as Chapman uh, said in a newspaper article uh, much later in life, that uh, when he was told of this, the, the gift was going to come through that Rockefeller had agreed to make this gift. Um, he, he had a, he had a tough thing that he had to do. He had to sit on the news for about six weeks. <laughs> they said he about killed him, that he had to wait six weeks before they made the announcement. But make, make the announcement they did. Oh, by the way, here, here he is with, uh, with honor camera, camera on the right, who's the assistant director and also, uh, Horace Albright, uh, then the director of the national park service. So, uh, Chapman was, you know, was probably a bulldog in Knoxville, but he was probably a bit of a bulldog and a, and a, and a canny negotiator in, in D.C. and New York as well. So, uh, again, the father of the National Park in, in action. Um, but here's, here's a great uh, great uh, headline front page that Jack found yesterday of, uh, of the Rockefeller gift to Shaw Smokies Park. Of course, it wasn't just $5 million. Um, you know, kids in, in Knoxville were giving dimes and pennies and uh, they – Knox, uh, the Smoky Mountain Association raised like hundred thousand dollars in two in two days when they launched this big campaign. So you know, and this went across the state as well. But Knoxville donated quite a lot of money, uh, in, in quite, in quite including I don't have it in front of me, but uh, the, the city of Knoxville uh, donated a big chunk as well to get the Smoky moving. Yeah. And we'll zoom in on the photograph here. Um, wonderful to see that the second guy in the left it looks like he's got a cigar coming out of his mouth. I think that's just a little. Uh, floor on the newspaper scan, but uh, there's Willie Stavis on, on the second from left underneath the little sticker there, and there's Chapman in the in the middle, several other people. Um, it's hard to see yeah. totally on there, but uh, anything yeah. you want to add, Jack? Uh, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I think one of the Knoxville papers said this was the most momentous day in Knoxville history uh, when they announced the Laura Spellman Rockefeller gift of $5 million for, uh, for the Smoky Mountains, because it meant it was going to happen. And to look at the people who are here, we have a governor, a former governor or two. Uh, we have Willis Davis. We have uh, uh, Chapman, of course, uh, Governor Horton, um, uh, William S. Shields, the guy that uh, was behind Shields Watkins Field at, at UT just a couple of years earlier. Uh, James Fowler, who was a major mover and shaker here. Uh, but we look at this in Arno Camera. If you look at these this list of people, there are three or four people who have mountains named for them here. Uh, and Kerry Spence is there, Ben Morton, uh, uh, sometime mayor of Knoxville, uh, Cowan Rogers and so on. Uh, but it was, uh, this was, a, this was a remarkable thing. And these decisions were made uh, uh, in, in banks and in lawyers' offices and in engineers' offices, mainly in downtown Knoxville. Uh, and uh, that's, that's what I think we should be aware of, not, not to take anything away from the Smokies themselves, but to remember that this all this stuff happened here, um, and uh, just want to want to want to remind people of this and 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 kind of kind of celebrate it. Um, but uh, in the next one, we have a picture of where this happened, uh, and it was uh, this is the City National Bank, and this building is still it's not completely demolished. We think it's now uh, it was later uh, just a few years later uh, redesigned as the S and W Cafeteria. <laughs> 
and uh, is now the, what uh, Aveda Beauty Beauty uh, School. So it's uh, it's still there, and you can pay homage to it as you as you please uh, as you go by. But that was that was where this amazing assemblage of of, of uh, important people got together to mainly just to uh, formally accept the uh, the Rockefeller gift that that meant uh, once and for all the Smokies is going to happen in some way way shape or form as a national park. We also want to acknowledge, you know, this, that the uh, founding of the Smoky Mountain Hiking Club in uh, in October twenty four, and they're they're just on the cusp of celebrating their own hundredth anniversary in the next year. Uh, but so many, you know, this was an opportunity that so many Knoxvilleans took to get involved uh, in in a great organization that explored the, the Smokies and helped build trails, um, and still very much alive today. And this is a photo, one of uh, Thompson Brothers' uh, photographs from, from 1926. It's just, uh, and there's a wonderful repository of, of Smoky Man Hiking Club. It has its own digital collection now uh, at UT Library, which is wonderful. This is one of, this is actually from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park Archive. Uh, I'm not even sure where Uncle Tom's cabin is myself, but I always love this photograph. I don't think you could, I don't know, maybe you could replicate it today, which is wonderful. <laughs> But a lot of people like Carlos Campbell and, um, and Jim Thompson and a lot of them were, were members of the Smoky Mountain Hiking Club and Brockway Crouch. And if you're ever interested in seeing photographs, yeah, go to uh, UT Libraries and, and uh, you can see the old, um, the really informative handbooks, uh, that some of these uh, maps and stuff that we've got from today. But again, uh, I know Cindy Spangler's with us today. I really appreciate you, Cindy, and uh, the great work you've done with the Smoky Mountain Hiking Club and, and uh, preserving your own history of the club. Um, I want to mention Jim Thompson again, uh, you know, because in the late 1920s, even before the park officially became established in 1930, he was very active with um, the nomenclature committee with the Great Smoky Mountains Conservation Association and helped mark in the Appalachian Trail. And he was regarded really as, as, as the workhorse behind this, you know, uh, nomenclature of mapping the Great Smokies and understanding the names and avoiding duplication. And uh, he was just really cited as, as being instrumental in that and worked very closely with, with Paul Fink uh, and and Massa, George Massa and, and Horace Kepal as well, so kind of straddling uh, state lines. Um, yeah. Something pretty interesting happened in 1933 when um, David Chapman and this uh, fairly new member uh, to the, uh, the Tennessee, um, oh, what was it called, Jack? Do you remember the Tennessee Commission, Parks Tennessee Commission? Park Commission yeah. yeah, yeah. You want to pick up this story? Yeah, uh, so well, well, the were, Burwell building. It's it's a little bit complicated, but this was uh, this was in the Burwell building again. It may have been the same room where the whole uh, commission uh, was was founded uh, or nearby there. Uh, but George Dempster, uh, who was not yet famous as the inventor of the uh, the famous internationally famous Dempster dumpster, uh, uh, was uh, was was a, a big shot. He was a mover and shaker. Uh, was in charge of the Dempster Brothers uh, uh, equipment company. Um, but but he was uh, this, uh, perhaps a political appointee that that some people uh, didn't like that fact that there were politics entering the this uh, this thing. But he became. Uh, the the chairman of the uh, of the Tennessee Parks Commission, and uh, and David Chapman merely a, a member. Uh, and uh, they uh, Chapman uh, took uh, the opportunity at one meeting to criticize how how Dempster was 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 uh, doing his job, and he, he thought he wasn't being very efficient with the uh, with public funds in terms of how he was how he was using them uh, to the best advantage of the park. And uh, and Dempster recalled, uh, he responded. He said, "You're a goddamn common liar," is what he said to Chapman. Well, Chapman, uh, these are both grown men. Uh, uh, Chapman was probably in his fifties by this time, um, and Chapman, uh, as 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 feisty as he was, he punched Dempster in the face. Dempster was a bigger guy. He was a, a much younger guy than Chapman, but Chapman punched him in the face. And uh, and Dempster responded by pummeling uh, Chapman into a pulp, a bloody pulp. He was uh, was uh, was broke two ribs and a couple of teeth, uh, and uh, broke his glasses, I think. But it was uh, it was there. There were lots of uh, discussions later on of whether Chapman had a footprint on his face after the thing was over. 
but it was uh, but Chapman was 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 had to uh, see a doctor, and his doctor said, "You need bed rest. You need." Chapman actually checked into the Andrew Johnson Hotel and just treated like a hospital for a, for a week or so. But he came back uh, before, he, but he wasn't quite done. He actually, the meeting adjourned. He came back when they re, reopened it and, and had a few more things to say through his, uh, through his swollen mouth. Uh, but uh, it was a, uh, it was a, a, a weird uh, incident that, that shows us that these weren't all, all just merry comrades, you know, all on the same page. They, there were lots of disagreements among them, um, and uh, especially with Mr. Wright and, and also Mr. Townsend, uh, as things went on. Uh, but this was uh, uh, this was uh, 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 an inter interesting moment. Also, it's interesting to notice the date of it. January 10th is just weeks before, after the election of Franklin Roosevelt, but weeks before his uh, his inauguration on March 4th. Uh, and uh, it was about money. And after uh, the New Deal kind of took over parts of the uh, of the Smoky Mountains I idea, and they they made things a lot easier for for applying money from the government directly into the uh, into the mountains, and also opened up something called the Civilian Conservation uh, Corps, uh, which uh, which uh, uh, made made it made it possible to use federal workers to. To build uh, build uh, uh, build bridges and also trails and things in the Smoky Mountains, but this is right before that. This is still during the Republican Hoover administration, and they were still uh, the, the the Coolidge Hoover years was a time when they said we love the park idea, but you're going to have to raise all the money for it, folks. But that changed a bit during the uh, the Roosevelt administration, and and the Roosevelt administration really polished it, uh, and and even though it was already a park. More or less, it was it was uh, they 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 kind of made it a lot easier on people like like Chapman uh, to uh, to to say this this is done and we're proud of it. So the following year, Jack, it was official. He, it was officially opened. Well, I mean, it was already open, but the, you know, the official chronology is that it became official in 1934. And I don't know. I don't have a picture today, but if you if you Ever read Smokey's Life? It's a great magazine, by the Great Smoky Mountain Conservation, uh, not associate, Great Smoky Mountain Association, separate organization for the conservation organization. There is a story that I co-wrote with uh, Ken Wise and Al Bedinger about the uh, birth of the association. But there's also a wonderful little uh, um, story about uh, from Arthur McDade about postage stamps and the fact that the U.S. government postage division chose one of Jim Thompson's photographs to become one of several. Um, U.S. postage stamps, which is issued right at the same year, right at the same time that the Smokies was opening officially. So that's great recognition for the Smokies, but also great recognition for Knoxville's own Jim Thompson. So what what, what were other Knoxvilleans kind of up to in this uh, in, the, in, in the 30s? Uh, we know that uh, the next year, uh, Harry Iams had, had kind of illustrated these uh, poster stamps, this six, set of 16 poster stamps that were produced by the Great Smoky Mountains Conservation, Conservation Association. Uh, some of them were based on photographs by Carlos Campbell, um, particularly the one of um, uh, Ramsey's Cascade over here. Um, here's a, uh, actually here, yeah, here's a couple here blown up and that's, uh, that, that, that one on the right is, is basically a redrawn version of one of Carlos Campbell's uh, photographs of, of uh, Ramses Cascade. Also in 1937, Laura Thornborough, um, writing as Laura Thornborough, um, published uh, her book on the Great Smoky Mountains. This is the second edition with the front cover illustrated by Harry Imes again. But uh, I don't know how many times this was uh, was reprinted, but this was uh, really kind of almost like a Bible of uh, not, almost like a travel guide, but a very strong narrative uh, guide to the Smokies. Uh, she was a um, film editor, as uh, Janine Winfrey is writing about in our next uh, edition of Knoxville Lives, Knoxville Lives 5. That will be out by the end of the year. Janine works for, for Tamis, and she's done some great research into Laura's early days as a film editor, and one of the first female editors, film editors of the country. Was also a journalist for the Knoxville News Sentinel, uh, and a wonderful writer, and a great photographer as well. So she was very multiple, multi-talented. Um, a great addition to the, uh, the literature of, uh, of the Smokers uh, in the 30s and beyond. I think it was in print of the 70s, maybe even later. Um, 
But in 1940, on September the 2nd, 1940, uh, the Smokers eventually was dedicated. Jack, you want to talk about the dedication and kind of wrap us up? Yeah, I, I, a lot of people see this and think this that that Roosevelt founded the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and that it was a whole New Deal project and it, the New Deal made it better. But as we know, uh, it was mainly a grassroots thing that started with uh, with a, a few people here who who wanted to make it happen. And it was a massive. The hard part was done before the Roosevelt administration. That was acquiring the land. There were thousands of parcels of land that had to be to be put together to make this a national park. Uh, and uh, but anyway, this was a uh, this was kind of the 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 cherry on top of the of, of the, the thing. And I think we can finally say it. All this work was done, and it was worthwhile. And uh, and it's uh, it's uh, and I think that's. Uh, that's probably one of the most famous pictures of uh, of uh, Smoky Mountains and 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 in, in history, the one that you see a lot. But I think it's it can be misleading if you don't know the rest of the story because it's been 17 years of hard work on on lots of people's parts, uh, especially uh, the Davises and uh, and Chapman and and others uh, to make this uh, to make this a reality. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, they were. Uh, uh, it was a a, 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 a great Herculean effort uh, with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, setbacks and cautionary tales, and uh, that uh, that I think is 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 a story worth telling, and we're glad to be here, and uh, uh, as part of what I think is going to be uh, many events in in months and years to come, celebrating the centennial of the Smoky Mountains National Park. We just have a couple more slides. I just want to mention uh, this was a photograph that was in that article. Uh, members from Knoxville, from the Great Smoky Mountains Conservation Association with the uh, North Carolina um, contingent. Um, we've got Jim Thompson here on the left, uh, far right really, at the, kind of between the front row, front row and the back row is, uh, is Arthur Stupka, who was, uh, I don't know if he was the first park ranger, but he was certainly the first park naturalist in the, in the very early 30s and very well renowned. Um, the lady in the front, Sadie Patton, uh, thanks to our board member, Georgiana Vines, asking me who she was. Well, she was uh, a historian from Andersonville, North Carolina, um, and she was very involved in preservation over there and been on this committee for several years. Um, and at the back here, on the back, uh, second of the left, is, is Carlos Campbell, and we kind of want to end on him. Just for the fact that uh, for for year, you know for several years in the in the late fifties he was paid uh, by the conservation association to research how the, how the national park came to get to came together and it was published by UT Press in nineteen sixty birth of a national park it's still in print um, might seem a little dry to read it but it's it's a really sort of wonderful and uh, amazing book um, of, of how the national park came to be and the nuts and bolts of it is as you were. As it were, and then you know he wanted to publish his memoirs in the 1960s, but no one was interested in anybody publishing um, memoirs um, at, at that era. So it wasn't really uh, the, the 90s, I think, that or the early 2000s that this this book, Memories of Old Smoky, came out. And uh, it's kind of a flip coin, I guess, of the birth of the national park. It's it's not about how the park was formed; it's about how people enjoyed it and went on expeditions and built trails and you know fought their way through, you know, briar pastures to get from one place to another. Uh, both books are just completely different, but uh, amazing in their own right. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, as, as we as an organization uh, want to tell this story is, is Knoxville's role. And uh, obviously they work with people across the state, they worked across state lines and all together is, is, is an amazing team. Uh, built the Great Smoky Mountains. And, you know, it's easy for us to take it for granted. We were open to questions, but I want to make, before we switch off the slideshow, want to highlight, um, well, one more thing. Jack wants to say a little bit about the Andrew Johnson Hotel. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I want to end on this. Just in, yeah. in, in general about, uh, you know, this began as a civic project. The Chamber of Commerce thought this was going to make Knoxville into this wonderful city. Uh, and they, uh, a lot of this was, was Knoxville people spending weekends and nights uh, just working and working and working. On this on this job, and also also spending money on it, donations from thousands of Knoxvillians, uh, and also uh, the city itself. They used taxpayer money to help buy land for the uh, the, the the 
Grace Smoky Mountains National Park. What did it result in? Did it result in this uh, this great uh, boon? Well, uh, you can look at some things like the Andrew Johnson Hotel, which I doubt would have been built if not for the anticipation of the uh, of the uh, Smoky Mountains tourists that they were expecting and and got for many years. That was a very busy hotel for a, a few decades. And also Henley Street Bridge, uh, some of the, that was built by the city taxpayers, but it was uh, but it was you know it was built because they knew it was it was going to lead to this grand new national park. Um, but that was uh, all these things were were happening, and and I think Knoxville did for twenty or thirty years enjoy to some extent the, the results of this. Uh, but uh, but then of course, well, in the nineteen seventies, uh, the Knoxville was no longer the gateway to the Smokies. It was Sevier County and Blount County had their own hotel rooms. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hotel rooms closer to the Smokies than uh, than Knoxville is. Uh, so that's that's different now. And another funny thing is that when they, the the national park uh, was officially announced as as fully done in 1934, although they kept making some some touch ups after that, um, uh, it this was a time that Knoxville was really declining in many ways. It wasn't just the depression. People came here in 1936 and said, "What a dump the city is. It's, it, nobody's paying attention to anything." And it's it's kind of ironic. And we actually uh, of course, in 1947, John Cunther said, "This is the ugliest city in America," uh, and uh, and uh, he wasn't the only one to say things like that. In fact, most press Knoxville got in the 1930s, 40s, 50s was was pretty bad, and Knoxville actually lost more than 10 percent of its population in the 1950s. This is not the uh, the supercharged city that they saw in the 1920s. Why? And, and I, one reason is that Knoxville was being at the center of a wonderland of, of of attractions out in the out in the out in the countryside, uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park was the first big one, and then of course the TVA started opening up these recreational lakes and so forth. People started leaving Knoxville, evacuating the city every weekend because they wanted to go hiking, they wanted to go uh, boating, uh, they wanted to go uh, get it you know, on their to their houseboat or their lake house, uh, they wanted to go fishing. Uh, it was they were. Knoxville, I think, to a greater extent than any other city of its size, was suddenly uh, distracted. And I think that's one reason that people like John Cunther came here and said, why is anybody picking up the trash in this in this uh, in this city? Why, you know, what's nobody's paying attention? And because we were all uh, uh, enjoying the, the, the glories of, of, of the Smokies and we did a great job with that. But I think we we didn't pay attention to the city. And a lot of other, a lot of things we should have been paying attention to during that time, and a whole, a whole generation of idealistic young people were were inspired by the Smokies. Anyway, not to say that we shouldn't have done all this stuff, but it was it's kind of a cautionary tale. Uh, anytime you have a city that's devoted to improving something that's forty miles away, um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, that's just uh, another part of the story, and uh, we're we're happy to tell to. to tell all of it warts and all and, and wanted to would love to hear uh, hear your your thoughts and and anything uh of course this isn't complete we're just scratched the surface i've got the names of 150 other people in my notes that we didn't get to but uh, thanks for joining us tonight and come join us for some of these other things as well appreciate it any 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 comments or questions we do have a question on the chat jack about yeah. um, many problems with the lumber company there did they own the land or just own it yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at the first half of the question, perhaps. I mean, I, th I think it's complicated. You know, Wilson B. Townsend, Colonel Townsend, as he was known, you know, came down from Pennsylvania and developed a big swath of the Smokies. Um, the company was very, very successful. Um, he was also, he was very philanthropic. He was really beloved. And, you know, the little village of Tang was renamed Townsend in, in his honor, I think, like 1901, 1902. Um you know, we we covered the story earlier on earlier on about Annie Davis uh, helping you know with the bill to acquire seventy six thousand acres uh, from the Little River Lumber Company that he owned. Well, he did, he sold it for like I think three dollars an acre, which seemed like a fantastic price at the time. But the proviso was that they still owned the rights to continue to remove trees. I can't remember for how long after, but it was quite a bit. And I think Jack was telling me earlier today that. 
I think maybe at the end it became a bit contentious. Uh, I'm not sure the details of that. So it's it's, yeah. it's complicated. And there were probably, you know, other landowners, you know, yeah. when in 19, we didn't really, you know, we didn't couldn't talk about it today, but in 1925, when Paul Adams was hired to manage the first camp on top of Mount Lacan, um, you know, which is where the lodge is today. That lodge was built, I guess, in the, in the 20s, uh, later 20s. But, you know, that was the Champion Fiber Company. You know, there was big companies that owned big, vast tracts of land. So it was it was pretty complicated. Yeah. And it was it, also it was, dangerous work, very dangerous work. Yeah, it was indeed. And and I think he was probably one of the biggest lumber companies, but not the only one that was working in the Smokies. Um, but that was, there was a big, uh, uh, he, he's both a hero and a villain in, in the whole story, uh, because he, uh, he, he got people interested in the Smokies that hit the Mont to begin with. And then, and then, uh, um, uh, was, uh, but later on did make possible the, these land sales for still profitable land, uh, for, you know, timberland. But in 1929, he started pushing back a good deal and getting his lawyers, <laughs> And uh, and 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 saying I, I still have the right to, uh, to to clear cut this area if I want to, and that and he did actually just to, I think to to prove it and, and caused a lot of bitterness there for a while. But uh, Townsend was another Knoxvillian, by the way. He lived on Cohen Avenue, right next to where the law school is. In fact, I think the the addition to the law school is on his on his mm -hmm. uh, on his old house, which was a be beautiful, very. Uh, 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 very wooden house. You go inside, and there were there was lots and lots of uses of wood. Uh, obviously, from a guy that who made his career with this. And I'm really I'm sorry this the house is is no longer there, but um, it was uh, torn down probably 30 years ago. But um, but uh, yeah, another another interesting story. But that shows how complicated and how difficult this was for for all the people involved. Other questions or comments? I want to say I learned a lot tonight. Uh, I thought I knew a, a lot about the history of the park. I'm going to have to do a revision in my book. <laughs> <laughs> and Jack and Paul, I've sent you some comments and notes. I just wanted to point that out to you. Okay, appreciate that. Thank, thanks, George. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the name. Yeah, yeah and, and you have a, a, a great deal of connection to national parks. So you, you came here... Uh, uh, your your was your dad? Um, was he? He was here, right? And he was here in sixty three through sixty eight. They were already here when I came. Yeah, my family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And my superintendent of the National Park. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. So he yeah. was. I forgot which superintendent was. He was an early one compared to yeah. the number they've had since. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Regina. Welcome. Jack, in recent years, there have been contentions from the North Carolinians that they were the ones that started the park. And obviously, from the discussions tonight, they may have had a, an idea, but uh, couldn't get it started. And, uh, the yeah, bulk yeah. of the uh, movement was here. Uh, once things started rolling in the, the 20s, uh, how much involvement did the uh, folks across the mountain have in yeah, supporting well, the project? They, they they weren't very cooperative right at first because they had their own idea of making Grandfather Mountain uh, a, a different national park, and uh, that was uh, uh, that was that was that they were hard to get interested until the mid twenties, and then uh, of course they we had to get them interested because they had to get the legislature North Carolina legislature involved and so forth to make this happen. So there were uh, there were there was a good deal of mainly friendly uh, uh, back and forth between the two. Um, I, I don't know how many people I didn't. Uh, Paul mentioned it briefly, but the Ken Burns uh, series was uh, about national parks was fascinating, but perplexing when it came to uh, uh, the Smokies because they taught mainly about uh, Horace Kephart and George Massa, who were both extremely talented guys who's I've admired for long before that series. Uh, I've been to uh, uh, Masa was a very artistic photographer, uh, uh, and you might even say, uh, in some ways, as, as, as an artist, is a you know personal artist, uh, uh, maybe even superior to Jim Thompson at times. Uh, and Horace Kephart wrote this great book, Our Southern Highlanders, about the people who lived in the Smokies. Uh, but the, they've made a lot of claims in that in that in that uh, documentary that I try. I they really surprised me, and I tried to track them down. And was even in touch with uh, their writer, who was angry at me because I wrote a column 
uh, kind of saying, what, what what are you talking about here? Because it was it was these people, it was David Chapman, these people, uh, and why, why I'll leave out Annie Davis didn't mention her in the in the thing, um, and uh, uh, and and he he never told me. Uh, I kept asking, well, where did you find this information that Kephart and Massa were these these intrepid promoters of the Smoky Mountains because they. Kephart wrote a couple of essays. One of them was was illustrated by Jim Thompson photographs, not George Massa photographs, and uh, and the other one I know of was not il illustrated at all. And but uh, but they were both important. Massa was a a guy everybody liked. He was he was a, he helped cut trails in the Smokies, and there's stuff named for him in the Smokies. And uh, but he, uh, it's hard to say. It's hard to call him one of the founders, and it's hard to call Kephart one of the founders too. But Kephart was in his 60s and was was really interested in in the people who had lived in, in the Smokies, and he was a little bit slow to come around to the idea of a national park. By 19 late 1925, he wrote a, an essay saying, "Okay, let's do it." But uh, he wasn't one of the first people uh, to do it uh, to, to talk about that. But but I, I, I it was a great a sentimental uh, story about two very interesting and worthy people, but. Um, but I, I think they overstated several things in that uh, in that documentary, and I and I, everybody who at at UT and McClung Collection and Tamas who's looked at they they all complained about it at the time, and uh, and I it, it, they made they're really looking for looking for a personal story, uh, and and found one that and I think just kind of exaggerated it a, a good deal and for 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 impact in the. In the in the story, but, but but I think the whole Knoxville story is is fascinating enough. And the fact is, they they admitted they didn't send any researchers to Knoxville at all. UT has this amazing trove of uh, of of film and other things. So does Tamas. So does McClung Collection. And uh, they just didn't have. They they borrowed one picture, uh, something they that they you know a specific thing they wanted. But uh, uh, but anyway, that's. Uh, uh, yeah, it's That's disappointing. My, yeah. yeah, my two bits uh, about that. But, uh, one other, uh, this one's a question. You mentioned that the Davises lived at uh, Laurel and 17th Street. Was yeah. that uh, Fort Sanders Manor where they lived? That's right. Yeah, yeah, that was it, right. It's still, I lived still in there. two apartments there where I was in college, and oh. it was a rundown old building at the time. So it must well, have been uh, a quite nice place. Um, it, 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 it was probably at it, its highest in the 1920s. Earlier. Yeah, it's, it's it's pretty. I think it's a pretty nice place now. Uh, they they they. I, I think they still like visiting actors at, for Clarence Brown. Uh, sometimes stay there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a, a beautiful old building. I, I wish we still had apartment. Yeah, I, I, I wish we still built apartments like that. Um, I loved it. Thank you all. Great job. Thanks. Really. Thanks. Appreciate you coming. Thank yeah, you. appreciate it. Other questions or comments? All right. Well, appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll we'll see you uh, next time. I hope.